Hello and welcome to this OECD webinar with me, Duncan Crawford. Today, we're discussing how to unleash the full potential of digital technologies in the world of education. This is not just about buying more computers or tablets. It's about much more than that. It's about ensuring that education systems can reap the full benefits of digital technologies, which many countries are failing to do so at the moment. So what needs to happen? What policies need to be implemented to ensure there can be positive changes in classrooms in regard to digital technologies? Well, I'm glad to say a new OECD report is out today, funded by the European Union, which might just have a few of the answers. It's called Shaping Digital Education, Enabling Factors for Quality, Equity and Efficiency. And it looks at what policies need to be implemented as a whole to ensure digital tech can really have a positive impact on learning and education. I'm glad to say we have a great panel of guests today to join us for this discussion, to look at some of the main findings of this report, to discuss it. Uh, first joining us is Axel Jean, Head of the Support for Digital Innovation and Applied Research Office at France's Ministry for National Education and Youth. The OECD's Director for Education and Skills, Andrea Schleicher, joins us as well. Dragana Kupres, Project Manager at the Croatian Academic and Research Network, Carnet. Chief Expert at Estonia's Education and Research Ministry, Hela Halik. And Antoinetta Angelova Kristava, Director for Innovation, Digital Education and International Cooperation at the European Commission. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. Uh, we have got a lot to discuss, so let's get right to it and start with Antoinetta Angelova Kristava from the European Commission, uh, who's going to outline what's happening at the European level regarding digital technology. Over to you. Thank you very much, Duncan, and good afternoon uh, to everyone. It is indeed my great pleasure to join you at today's event on the launch of the OECD's report on shaping digital education, enabling factors for quality, equality, and efficiency. So this uh, report is an excellent uh, illustration of the close collaboration between uh, our two institutions and indeed uh, contributes a lot to the established uh, links and cooperation that we have with the OECD's Education and Skills Directorate on one side and Directorate General for Education, Youth, Culture and Sport of the Commission on the other side. It goes without saying uh, that uh, in any policy area, we need robust data and evidence and uh, OECD is known, acknowledged, and very much respected and appreciated for the work it is doing in this field, as well as for the analysis it is uh, producing. And uh, this is even more important for the digital education uh, area, which is still a relatively new field, and there's still a lot of gaps uh, to be filled. So while we are very interested and glad to see uh, the increased interest to this area, and we do acknowledge its high importance, we also must uh, acknowledge that we don't have yet comprehensive, up-to-date and internationally comparable data on many elements of the digital education ecosystem. For example, we don't know yet how much uh, we, the digital uh, technologies are used, what is the provision of digital technologies and how they are applied in teaching and learning. And one of the factors for this is indeed the lack of systems or mechanisms to monitor the digital infrastructure of the educational institutions. Therefore, it is indeed important uh, to work together on developing evidence to help us develop more effective policies and measures to support our educators and learners and to even further unleash the potential of digital technologies. So the ongoing digital transformation of our society and economy calls for education and training systems which can adapt and respond to new and evolving learning needs. But to master the digital transition, we definitely need digital skills and competencies. At your level, we have set our ambitions high. And this means that by 2030, 
we want to raise the number of adults with basic digital skills to 80%. We also want to raise the number of ICT professionals to 20 million, while simultaneously attracting more women in this profession. And we also want to reduce the share of eight graders who underachieve in computer and information literacy to less than 15%. So to achieve this, you may know that on the side of the commission, we have already put this together in a common vision, uh, which allows and describes our objectives and ambitions in the field of digital education. We would like to achieve high quality, inclusive and accessible digital education in Europe with a strong commitment to work together at all levels, from the local to the national and international. And the European Commission has set out its vision, namely in the Digital Education Action Plan covering the period 2021 and 2027. And there are two strategic priorities that are defined in the action plan, namely to foster the development of a high-performing digital education ecosystem and to develop digital skills and competencies for all. So since the launch of the Digital Education Action Plan, we have uh, achieved a lot and we are well on track in implementing the individual actions. But we are also aware that there is much more to be done. And this has been also confirmed by the structured dialogue that we carried out together with the member states last year. So the development of digital technologies is constantly growing but it doesn't fully match the pace of reforms in our education and training systems, and we definitely to be more ambitious. So to deliver on this ambitious, the Commission has put forward proposals for two Council recommendations. One of them is uh, looking at how to improve the provision of digital skills and competencies in education and training. It proposes a strengthened and integrated more inclusive approach of developing digital skills at school, vet and university level. And uh, it also recognizes the importance of teaching digital skills at an early age. The other one looks at the enabling factors of uh, successful digital uh, education. In particular, the proposal looks um, at how to put in place the necessary infrastructure, governance, and capacity building, and it sets out a blueprint for a coherent framework to put all these elements together. So what is also clear is that uh, the education sector cannot achieve all these ambitious uh, objectives alone. It is clear that all sectors need to work uh, together across uh, the different policy areas, and this is why the proposal for the Council recommendation uh, is putting forward and promoting the whole of government uh, approach. So the proposals are deeply rooted in uh, robust research on digital education, and we will hear more uh, about it from uh, Andres in his uh, presentation. But they also benefit uh, from the practices uh, and uh, lessons learned and uh, what is implemented uh, at national level by the member states. So this comes as a direct result also of the extensive work we've carried out uh, together with the member states last uh, year under the structured uh, dialogue, uh, which was focused on digital education and skills. So right now we are continuing with the member states, uh, the discussions uh, on these two uh, council proposals which are expected to be adopted by the end of uh, the year. Uh, this is, of course, a great opportunity to continue our joint efforts and to respond to jointly to the challenges and needs related to the digital transformation. We are, of course, uh, confident that we are not alone in this endeavor. We will continue working closely together with the education and training sector, with national authorities and institutions, with teacher and parent organizations, with learners. And we do strongly believe that this collaboration will continue and further grow. So today's event is indeed a wonderful event, uh, illustration and confirmation of our collective commitment 
towards enabling successful digital education, which is indeed featured by quality, equity, and efficiency, as the OECD report suggests. So I'm very grateful to uh, OECD and all colleagues uh, who have uh, worked on the report, but also to all colleagues who have organized today's uh, event. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussions and upcoming presentations. Thank you very much for your attention. Antoinette Angelova Kostava from the European Commission there. Thank you so much for those opening remarks. Uh, lots of interesting stuff for us to get into later on in the discussion. But for now, let's take a look at this new OECD report in a little bit more detail and turn to the OECD's Director for Education and Skills, Andreas Schleicher, who's going to outline the key findings to this report. Over to you, Andreas. Thanks so much, Duncan. And Antoinette has set the scene really perfectly for what you're going to see in this report. Let me just share my screen with you. Um, you should be seeing it now. Uh, basically, we've been trying to achieve a comprehensive overview of what is happening in digital education. The digital world opens amazing opportunities for education. It can make education more personal, more granular, more adaptive, more, more interactive. Now, while you study mathematics on a computer, the computer can figure out how you learn, and then you respond to that with a much more tailored offer. Uh, education can become more effective, more equitable. Uh, we can use resources better. We can super empower teachers as data analysts who actually understand how different students learn differently and then engage with that, with differentiated uh, <coughs> educational practices. But the point is that none of this is an automaticity. It really takes good public policy. It really takes strategic design for you know, better technology to translate you know, better education practice in better learning outcomes. Technology is not a magic power. It's just an amazing amplifier and an accelerator, but it will amplify and accelerate good educational practice in the same way it amplifies poor educational practice. The kind of AI-based algorithms that are in play today can you know, give teachers so much better information and then help them tailor instruction in new ways. It can make them great coaches, great mentors, great facilitators. At the same time, you know, it can make learning more scripted, more passive, more reactive. So how we do on this really depends on public policies. We try to identify the challenges, but also look at promising practices that can help, you know, realize the potential of education. Let's start, you know, with some of the bottlenecks. As you can see from this chart, when it comes to the availability of uh, devices for instruction, that's the technology, the hardware. You can see there's still a fair amount of work to do. You can see on average across OECD countries, you see about 60% of students are in schools whose principals say that, you know, the different, <clears throat> uh, the number of digital devices for instruction is sufficient, but that means 40 do not agree with this. And, uh, <clears throat> You have a number of countries here where this is much, much lower. Or even equally important, devices at the school are sufficiently powerful in terms of computing capacities. Also there, you can say it is the case in many countries, but by far not in all. Or the availability of adequate software is sufficient. Also there, we can see quite significant gaps. So basically what this shows us, the, the first digital divide is still present. And that doesn't even you know, include the second and third digital divides that Antonietta actually alluded to. Uh, do students have the capacities? Do teachers have the capacities? Uh, so this is you know, the starting point, creating a more level playing field, ensuring that technology enhances equity and doesn't you know, expose new inequalities. What's also interesting that even where technology is in play in classrooms, uh, it doesn't always lead to better learning outcomes. You know, what you can see here in most countries, teacher-led users, you know, teachers using PowerPoint, teachers using you know, devices in front, basically is typically associated with better learning outcomes. So, and that's not so difficult to understand. You know, obviously when you're using you know, great presentation devices uh, as a teacher, you can actually show things much better. 
But what is more troubling is that that is not true when it comes to student-led uses. No? We can see the significant potential here. No? So why would you listen to a teacher explaining to you the result of a scientific experiment? Well, you can do that experiment nowadays in a virtual laboratory. But you know whether it comes to you know internet searches or you know uh, you know game based learning, all of that. We see often that the intensity of their use is negatively related to learning outcomes, and that really shows that uh, you know if we just use technology to conserve existing pedag pedagogical practice, we'll probably achieve worse outcomes. Now, the key really is to use technology to transform educational practice. And there's a range of policy levers that we can deploy for that. Now, when you ask, you know, teachers, school leaders, what are the difficulties with this? They tell, say, well, you know, curricula and assessment are still in the, in the, in the paper-based age. Now, we teach, you know, students to learn answers rather than to teach them to ask the right questions and so on. Now, there is insufficient time. There is insufficient maybe incentive for educators to get really deeply involved. Now, and there you can see the pandemic was a kind of massive accelerator in this. People had no choice. And suddenly, actually, most teachers turn out to be quite capable in this. Now. But there's clear also a lack of uh, capacity for, for digital education, new pedagogies, new kind of teachers are not always creative designers of innovative learning environments that are tech enabled. Now. As you could see, there are gaps in digital devices, connectivity, money, always an issue. And then, you know, Technology brings a range of risks, you know, from cyberbullying to you know <clears throat> a biased kind of approaches to learning. Lots of things. So what this report actually does, it puts these things in order and looks at the kind of solutions that we need to look at. Curricular and assessment. You can look at Greece. It's for some years now invested in redesigning, reimagining its curriculum, putting digital education not on top of the curriculum, but really making it the heart. And uh, in a very, very interesting effort. Digital infrastructure. Now you look at Uruguay, Plan Cebal, uh, basically ensuring that everyone has access to the basic infrastructure. And, uh, or you look at you know, the regulatory environment. How do we reconcile you know, the free flow of digital data with at the same time you know, confidentiality and personal security? You can look at the UK. Uh, providing a data protection toolkit for schools or capacity building. Now, France's reference frameworks for teachers' digital competencies, spelling out you know, what it is that teachers need to acquire and how to support them. Now, money. Now, in Germany, the Digital School Pact uh, has you know, provided a significant level of resources to, to, you know, to address some of the bottleneck in digital provision. And then human resources policies. And you can look at the Croatia, considering teachers' efforts on digital pedagogies, uh, how they feed into career progression. So there are really good answers to those challenges, and we have compiled them in this report. That's really a very, very important kind of dimension of that. But you know, we need more than that. We need clear and coherent strategies that pull those policies uh, together. And uh, the range of you know, strategies that this report displays, Let's, let me just pick a few. First of all, it's about building a vision for digital education, right? giving people an image of what is possible and how can we attain that. Right? You can look at Japan that has uh, put you know, quite comprehensive vision together in, on the use of artificial intelligence and blockchain technologies in education. You can look at a more concrete kind of action plan in Colombia and in Lithuania, where there are very clear kind of time-bound goals to ensure that the strategy actually happens, is, is implemented, that we don't lose sight of what is important. There are you know, uh, <coughs> funding mechanisms. That's always, you know, digital in investments cost time, cost money. We need to make space for that, make funding available on a predictable basis so that people trust those kinds of developments. And there you can look to Germany, uh, to Spain. And last but not least, the toughest area is who is responsible for what and how. And here, the Slovak Republic has done really well in delineating responsibilities between you know, what's done at the center and what's done at the front. Line. So those kinds of strategic functions are really, really important. If you do not know where you want to go, it's very, very hard to, to get there. 
What is also clear, however, that far from all countries have a strategic vision for digital education. You can see from the survey countries that we surveyed, you know, less than half have a, actually a specific digital strategy for education. Some countries include digital provision in a kind of broader strategy, but there's also a range of countries, 16%, that actually have no strategy yet. So it's a lot of work to do to build coherence, but the report provides good guidance, good models for how this can be done. And last but not least, you know, digital education is always a means, not the end. Uh, we need to ensure that we track investments in digital education policy, that we monitor the state of digital uh, education. Right? And that is about the hardware, that's about, you know, the policies, the practices, the pedagogies, how this evolves that digital education comes to its, uh, <clears throat> its full needs. The Flemish community of Belgium is a great example. Every five years, they take stock of where they are, survey the people at the front line. You know, this is not about dev the devices coming from the top. It's really about how is this going to be deployed? How is it used? You can see actually a good example there, uh, how this has been done. And last but not least, you know, learn more about the outcomes of this. How do, does digitalization improve quality? How does it improve equity? and how it helps us to achieve more with less resources. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation, Andreas. Absolutely fascinating stuff. And we're going to dig down into a lot of that information in a moment with our panelists. First though, uh, before we do, thanks to all of you who are joining this webinar, uh, people joining from Florida, Brazil, Hobart in Tasmania, that may be a first. Uh, Melton Mowbray in the UK, Slovakia, California, many, many other countries and uh, cities all right around the world. To, so thank you to all of you for watching and please do get involved. If you have a question for Andreas or any other member of the panel, then please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom feed. Uh, alternatively, if you're watching via Facebook, you can also send us a question via Facebook as well. Now, though, let's get to it and let's get stuck in to uh, the discussion. Uh, who should we start with? I think uh, Axel Jean, uh, head of the Digital Innovation and Applied Research Support Office at France's National Education and Youth Ministry. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Andreas has just outlined some of the policies needed to make a difference. What is France doing specifically to try to unleash the full potential of digital technologies? Thank you very much. I'm so glad to be with you today. So thank you very much for the invitation and sorry for my English if I miss some points sometimes. So what we are doing now in France, it's we are dealing with innovation and um, education at the earth of possible transformation uh, for the whole society and obviously for education. Uh, what has been said before is um, uh, correctly aligned with what we did because um, obviously um, there is a strong national and international activity uh, around innovation in education. And what we did in France was aligned with the Digital Education Action Plan committed by the European uh, Commission, so for, from uh, coming from Europe, what is called DEEP, Digital Education Action Plan. And um, what we did in France, we have defined a digital strategy for education, as it has been said before, quite like in a lot of countries. And um, our digital strategy is aligned with a um, digital education action plan coming from Europe. And what we did, uh, everyone has seen that um, digital education was very important, but since last November, something occurred coming from the generative artificial intelligence uh, capacity. So we deal with that and we, had, we have a um, digital um, uh, strategy specified for artificial intelligence because we think that uh, it can change quite a lot of things in order to teach and in order to learn. So um, uh, there is a lot of issues to consider. It's the one really evident are the one from educational point of view, but there is issue coming from societal, legal, ethical, technological, economic. So it's uh, quite important to make everything work all together. And it's important for us to build a framework of trust that respect uh, democratic, democratic sorry, issues based on ethical and legal um, expectation, scientific and centered, um, um, and centered sorry, on teachers and students. For a point of view, everything has to be considered. And our director is um, very um, 
um, strict with that. Everything has to be considered with the usual teacher and student always in the loop at the center of all of our considerations. So when we decide something, we have to decide to think, is, is it useful for the teacher in order they teach to the student? And will it be useful for the student in order they learn something better using digital technology instead of do not uh, using this uh, kind of technology? So everything is considered in these points. And we've got uh, four, um, four main areas that we consider till 2027. Uh, the first one is an ecosystem committee to a shared pol a public policy. So we make work all together, for example, the laboratory the for the research part, the ed tech coming from the company, uh, the, the, the common digital coming from free uh, society, um, obviously the teachers and the parents. The second point is to define a digital education that develop systematically, um, which is specifically intended to have um, competencies around citizenship and digital skills. So uh, we all have different curricula, but the center of the of the subject is to make some citizens that are that have um, who have sorry a critical mind. And to do so, we need to address this question with digital technology in school, because if we do not do that, uh, we know that companies address constantly the young students, uh, for example, with IE technology. And there is a digital um, literacy that we need to address specifically in school. So there is a very, um, we know that there is a lot of transformation occurring because probably we are living a um, um, digital revolution because of what I can do. That means that we need a lot of training session for our teachers and for the student, obviously, but we need to start with the trainers of teachers, with the inspector and with the teacher. Probably it's a huge effort that we need to do about the training of the teachers, but really huge, uh, much more than before. And the main point is to have um, to develop the, the competencies to have some uh, critical mind uh, um, OK for the student so that they are real citizens. So, so to have the good citizenship, we need them to be critical about the use of digital technology, and that has to be addressed at school. The third point for us is an education community supported by a sustainable and inclusive digital offering. So the digital offering come from two parts, the one developed by the EdTech under the control of the policymakers, and the second part is coming from the free society to, in order to have a common digital uh, shared by all the teacher and then shared by the student. So we, we used to say that we love to work on two, on both of our legs, one coming from the edtech and one coming from the free society, you know, the, co the common digital uh, developed by the initiative of teachers, for example. And the last uh, point is that we need the new ground rules for an information system at the service of its users. So when we have a um, um, technology or uh, digital technology, we have like a tri triangle coming from the school, working with research laboratory and working with edtech and common uh, digital um, development. With this triangle, we think that we've got the, um, the best way in order to have some innovative digital services. And obviously, this triangle needs to be regulated by the policymakers. So we make them working all together because without a um, research laboratory, we do not stay in science and we need to stay only in science and not in magical development. We need to work with the edtech because they know how to go to upscale and to go to, um, to succeed in scaling up the development of a good prototype. And everything has to be considered keeping always the teachers in the loop. So that's keep for us a lot of challenges to, to succeed in. But the, the, the best challenge and the very first challenge is to train a lot of uh, teachers so that they can succeed with digital technology in their classroom. It has been said before in, the, in the, one of the slides. In France, um, as we need to check and to help the teacher in order to, to scale up their competence, digital competencies, we have developed um, a product called PIX, which attests the level of the competencies of the teachers and of the students. 
So we've got um, uh, a services which is used, if I do not miss this point, with a colleague from Belgium. And, um, and this uh, PIX system is, a, is an incapacity for us, to, for the teacher to check their level, to level up with this level, and for the children to say, okay, when you are in a secondary school or at university, you are at this level of, of uh, digital um, competencies. And we are very aware of the, the point concerning the media and information literacy, because this point is not, um, is not linked only with mathematics or with French, for example, but the media and information literacy is one clue condition in order to stay in uh, citizenship in democratic um, countries. And we think that there is a, a very, very fair and very difficult point um, that has to be addressed only in, in, um, in our school, because if we do not do it in school with, a, with the media literacy, we will miss a very um, clear point and we will have some very huge difficulties in a very short time. So it's uh, only an introduction and, uh, and I will be pleased to answer thank, the questions. Thank you, Axel, that's really fascinating. Just a very, very quick follow-up to all that because you mentioned the importance of teachers being on board with all these changes. What's the reaction when you speak to teachers in, in France? Are they largely in favor or against these changes, proposed changes to their working practices? Um, to be honest, I think, um, I think it's, um, it's mitigated. Some of the pioneer user uh, just use them, for example, 20% of the teacher will use it, uh, will use digital technology because they, they find it very, very useful, for example, to have a much more inclusive school. And we know that digital technology are quite uh, useful in order to, to have a much more inclusive school for um, the special needs students. Um, but it's probably not the good, um, the good uh, way of thinking about that. It's not what the teacher want to do. It's a question of democracy. And if we do not train our teachers uh, with, uh, with this point, um, we will miss some things that is happening, which is huge. We are some of us uh, thinking that we are leaving a revolution, industrial revolution at this time. So our point is to train the teacher and they have to be trained. It's not a question of um, volunteer to do it. It has to be done because if we do not train our teacher, we will miss something very huge. So at this time, when we are not in a flat area and we are uh, leaving something with a lot of transformation, the point is that we need to train our trainers, our inspector and our teacher. And um, at this time, uh, I think um, in our time, actually, a teacher who do not want to deal with digital technology will just miss the world as it is. And the point of a teacher is to, to train the students so that they can work and they can live and they can change the world where they live. Thank you so much for that, Axel Jean from France's uh, Ministry for National Education and Youth. Let's turn to Croatia, get a perspective from there with Dragana Kuprez, the project manager at the Croatian Academic Research Network, Carnet. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, what's happening in Croatia to prepare young people and teachers for that matter to engage and learn better through digital technologies? There are a number of uh, uh, initiatives taking place in Croatia, Duncan, as well as in uh, most of the other countries in the world re related to digital uh, education. But today I would like to just briefly introduce you just one of the services that we have developed during our eight years eSchools project. We call it Digital Maturity Service. Uh, and um, uh, with that service, we are trying actually to um, have a comprehensive overview of what's happening in the digital education on a national level uh, to support the national government and national agencies in pinpointing the, the uh, improvement areas, areas needed uh, improvement or areas needed more support. But um, we use this service also to support each individual school because each individual school can assess themselves against five different areas of digital education and on the five levels of uh, digital maturity. And also the schools uh, can ask for external evaluation. Uh, the school can ask for external uh, experts to come and visit the school and talk with the school team, with teachers, with headmaster, and also uh, see uh, 
what are the areas uh, uh, where practice is really comprehensive and supporting students and their learning goals, and where do teachers and headmasters think that they need more support. So these, uh, that tool has given us incarnate uh, and in Croatia a comprehensive over overview how to plan and how to monitor our large scale investments like e-schools in Croatia. And we have been investing uh, uh, together with European Commission for eight years now, uh, investing more than 200 millions of euros worth equipment, but also a lot of education and training, what uh, Axel uh, thought about uh, previously. And I, I uh, support his argument that it's very, very important part of digital education. But without going into too, ma too many details, um, just want to uh, name that uh, among these five areas of digital maturity, only one dimension is related to infrastructure, to network and computing infrastructure, and also to devices of teachers and students and classrooms. And the four dimensions are related to people, to their competences, to how they use technology uh, in a pedagogical, really sound way, to the leadership and management of uh, technology within schools and also the digital culture. So yes, of course, we need to, we need to um, address uh, the digital divide in terms of uh, equipment and infrastructure, but also the digital divide in terms of uh, digital competences. And this is uh, where the, the digital maturity uh, comes into into play, uh, pinpointing the uh, strategically weak points or points needed much more attention. Uh, we can Forgive me, my microphone wasn't open. There we go. You can tell I'm a pro. Uh, Dragon Cupres, really interesting information there. And I wonder, you, you mentioned that there's been this huge investment in digital infrastructure in Croatia. Um, is that leading to better exam results, better learning outcomes, or is it too early to say? Uh, it is definitely leading to more motivation of students. And we know that uh, uh, higher the motivation of students uh, is related to uh, achieving more learning goals. So the influence is not direct. And many research co corroborates this, this finding. What also is extremely important, and thank you for asking this question, is um, for governments and for schools to have the independent research uh, tracking all the uh, investments and all the initiatives and learning also from our mistakes and also from, from our best practices. Thank you again for that, Dragona. Very interesting indeed. And let's get a perspective from Estonia now. Uh, Hella Halik, Chief Expert at Estonia's Education and Research Ministry. And I'm interested in your perspective because Estonia, obviously regularly named as a high flyer of education systems because famously put digitalization at the heart of its system very early on. Um, so part of that success, I suppose, depends on monitoring and evaluating how the digitalized program has been enacted and what is the perspective in Estonia? Has it worked well? And if what hasn't worked well as well, if you could uh, give us an idea about that. Uh, thank you. And thank you for an invitation to introduce what we are doing in Estonia. In Estonia, uh, the national curriculum in general education places emphasis on this uh, development of digital competencies. Actually, in 2014, digital competencies was introduced as one of eight key competencies in Estonian national curriculum. With in Estonian uh, education system, we have to mention that uh, the schools have an autonomy so that they can create their own school curriculum, but it has to be based on the national curriculum. And our teachers are also uh, have this autonomy so they can choose their teaching methods and the teaching content. So, uh, but they have to have the teaching so that uh, the learning outcomes of the learners uh, are matching the outcomes of national curriculum. Uh, to facilitate this uh, process for teachers to teach digital competencies, 
uh, we have developed the simple and clear digital competences models. Uh, and this also eliminates the need to, for every Estonian teachers to, uh, to independently create their own teaching materials, allowing them to focus on supporting the learners more. The learners model includes assessment criteria that describes the knowledge the learners possessed uh, by the end of the school level. Uh, for this uh, initial need for modeling and standardizing education digital competencies came with a renewal of our national qualification standard for teachers in 2017. This standard outlined the ability to incorporate technology in designing the learning environments and teaching practices. Uh, we also updated the version of this teacher's qualification standard in 2019, aligning the digital competencies of educators with a new European standard, uh, DigiComp Edu. Uh, as we monitored our digital competencies, we used a digital based tool, Digital Mirror, and it has been used more than 18% of Estonian schools to monitor the digital maturity. Uh, it was first used in 2016 and then again in 2019. Digital Mirror, as I said, is a web-based tool that enables any school team to self-assess the digital maturity of their organization as a whole. The tool also facilitates the planning of a whole school approach, uh, whole school teacher strategy, as well as an uh, aggregated strategy for schools in one city or in one district district and the pedagogical innovation indicators in digital mirror are uh, derived from the estonian national strategy for lifelong learning nowadays we don't use the digital mirror anymore we use uh, selfie for teachers so that teachers can evaluate their digital competencies by themselves and uh, also our Estonian Education and Youth Board uh, Digital Competencies Working Group has developed a tool for students so they can also assess their own digital competencies. As you asked before, uh, what we have learned from the monitoring our digital competencies, we learned that uh, uh, it is crucial to have the support endorsement and the encouragement from the school manager to build up these digital competencies of teachers and also the learners. Uh, uh, the uh, availability, functionality and maintenance of technology plays a significant control. And there has to be a shift in mindset, recognizing that technology isn't mean to an end, not an end goal itself. So, thank you so much for that, Hella. Very interesting indeed. I'm conscious that we haven't got that much time left, and there are lots of questions coming in. And I, I should give a special thanks to uh, Axel Jean from uh, France's Ministry of Education and Youth because uh, he's busy answering away in the Q and A chat function. So uh, good for him. But here's a few questions now. Actually, I, I want to bring in. Um, Andrea Schleicher from the OECD, because uh, Michael Babor on the chat is asking, uh, in North America, governments give little time and resources to supporting professional learning for teachers. Does the report suggest ways of addressing that? Yeah, I think this is a very important issue, and we have limited data for the United States in comparisons, but it is indeed true that the teaching load of American teachers is particularly high. That's been a consequence of relatively small class sizes. So teachers in the United States have less time for other things than teaching, and that includes professional development. And that often leads to schools, school districts, just buying software solutions rather than enabling teachers to become creative designers of those kinds of technologies. And that is a limitation. What we clearly see across countries where teachers are not at the heart of the design of those kinds of tools, they are usually not that effective in implementing that either. So I think there is a clear 
limitation other countries that you know make different trade-offs use te te teaching time differently and give teachers uh, more time more resources for designing developing and implementing technology-based solutions are doing clearly better estonia is a good example so is singapore we're actually professional learning communities in every school bring teachers together to really get on top of this agenda Sticking with the topic of teachers, Andreas, and if any other panelists are still there, please turn your cameras on. You can come in on this as well. Um, Lourdes Goncalves asked in the chat, um, what about teachers who are already in schools? How do you deal with teacher resistance to ideas for bringing in digitalization? Yeah, and that's, uh, that's obviously the big issue. You cannot address, you know, the needs in uh, through initial teacher training alone because technology changes so qu quickly. This is really about upskilling and reskilling in the teaching force, providing space, time and support for teachers to continue to evolve as, as technology evolves. And some countries do that really well. They seek ample time, ample support that teachers get in others. It's still a very kind of uh, novel experience. So I, I do believe making sufficient investments and that also is not something that is a matter of training courses alone it's very much of a you know a high degree of professional autonomy and a collaborative culture in the education systems that helps teachers along but very last point on this we should also not assume you can uh, you know roll a kind of technology-based policy out to all schools at once like in every other areas, you will have initially some innovators who are really, really good at that, who develop new tools. Then, you know, you, they're going to inspire, you know, a range of early adopters, uh, people who are actually willing to take a risk, make mistakes, learn from them, invest the extra mile in actually making this work. And then when you have that critical mass of people, you can build an early majority of teachers, you know, who actually try things out at scale. And when you have that, then is the time to deal with the laggards, you know, people who are very reluctant, resistant to change. If you try to get, you know, to everyone advance, uh, at, at, at once, you're unlikely to succeed. Dragana, I wonder if I can bring you in on that final point, which Andreas just made. And if you come up against uh, similar situations where there is some resistance to some of the changes what you want to bring in in regards to digitalization, but that it is a, a gradual, uh, something which you have to do gradually. I absolutely agree with Andreas. It takes time. We need to uh, include time in the equation of uh, harnessing all the potentials of dig digital technology. And we saw that we saw that in Croatia, uh, when we um, piloted our e-schools with 150 uh, schools in, back in 2016, it was uh, for many schools, a uh, uh, novel all institution uh, approach. However, those 150, that, that was uh, approximately 10% of schools, those schools were better equipped and, and better uh, prepared to meet the pandemic lockdown. And this is uh, especially because they have uh, been trained and educated the teachers, and they had time to experiment with technology, to fail, to try again and to build their, their confidence. And what we, what we also uh, saw from the research is that uh, where teachers are more, more digitally competent, they are more confident and they uh, by far have more positive attitudes to technology, to how they can use the potentials of technology. So this is also an equation raising digital competence, allowing time for uh, building the confidence and uh, the knowledge, and also allowing the, the space for failing. I know that it's not uh, an easy thing to say, uh, uh, especially for us, for our parents, we don't want to see our teachers fail in school, but this is how, how both teachers and our, students, our children learn, through trying, failing, and trying again. Hello, Halik from Estonia's Education Research Ministry. Were teachers in Estonia given space to fail for a long period of time? Actually, I can say that 20% uh, of our general education teachers are taking these uh, digital competence courses offered by our uh, education and youth board every year. So it's, it's, a, it's a quite good percentage. And I know that uh, they are doing a very good uh, job by evaluating these uh, learning outcomes of the teacher training uh, 
courses so that they could match the uh, European standard to Digomp Edu. They're always monitoring are there some competencies lack so we can create courses that support these learning outcomes for the uh, competencies we lack right now. Um, Axel Jean, how important is monitoring for France? Um, the power of data to assess whether digitalization policies are actually performing, I presume it's very important. Uh, yes, thank you for this question. If, if I may, I, I just want to react to what has been said by Andreas and... Um, and Please and the, go uh, ahead. Before. Yes, thank you very much. Um, perhaps we should... Um, the, the, perhaps the question is not only to, to think about the resistance coming from the teacher. To be very honest with you, probably we, are, we have much more resistance coming from the policymakers or from the inspector or for, for the trainers of teacher before. I think the point is not the difficulty with the teacher because the teacher are probably the one who loves to innovate from a long time ago. But the inspector and the, the one in charge of the authority of the teacher and the trainers of teachers, they need to change their mind and we need to change our mind too because we need to deal with a lot of transformation. So perhaps we need to, to make the teacher feel much more confident uh, in order to, to change the way they practice with digital technology. And, uh, and to succeed in that, we need to train. So that's why I, need, I insist so much on the training part of, the, of our teacher. But uh, I feel really confident about the teacher because they, they always innovate and they innovate from a long time ago, but we need some time to change our, the way of thinking uh, coming from the inspector and the trainers of teacher first. So it's, it's not that easy. And I, it has been said before, it takes a, long of, uh, a lot of time so we need times in order to train our teacher first and then to train the teachers and to help them and to make them much more confident. I insist on that, it has been discussed on the chat. Um, the point is not to look for the best practices. I think we need to stop with that. We need to help the teacher to find some good practices and good practices will be good enough for the student because best practices, as you said, when you, when you see a best practices coming from a good teacher, a very good teacher, the, the first point is that you said, okay, I'm not enabled to do that because it's best practices. What you need is to address 80% of our teachers and to address them correctly, to make them feel much more confident. We only need to have good practices. Good practices is fair enough for us. So I think it's something very important because we, we I think uh, in a lot of, in uh, um, many ministry, we are always searching for the best practices. And the best practices are good for the, the one, as Andrea said before, the one who innovate a lot, um, but are less than 20% of the, the, the teacher. So let's be clear with that. We only need good practices and it will be fair enough for the students and the teachers. Thank you so much for that. To get an international perspective on what Axel uh, just mentioned, Andrea Schleicher from the OECD. Um, are some of those issues common across all OECD countries or does it vary? Uh, it varies a lot, actually. We can see some countries that are very tech savvy that have, you know, a teaching profession and, as Axel said, you know, an education system that is very open to innovation, that has a level playing field uh, where actually, uh, you know, startups, small companies can actually play. And I would actually say Estonia is a great example for that. Uh, but there are other is as well. If you go to Korea, um, uh, Singapore, there are a number of education systems that have, you know, opened up and are very innovative and are also capable to scale innovation. I think that's the hardest part that we often have. We have many really good examples across countries, almost in any country, you can find some really innovative, you know, uses of technology, but education is not very good to look outwards, to connect, you know, good ideas, to, you know, connect great uh, schools, to build a strong teaching profession where teachers actually work together across you know, disciplines and schools. And I think where that happens, you have an amazing kind of uh, playing field. The pandemic was a great illustration. You know, those education systems were very quickly back on their feet, teachers, you know, immediately, and, and school, uh, schools immediately, you know, use those technologies to create, you know, contingency plans and measures. And I think that's a good sign you know, the, the resilience of the system. Thank you for that, Andreas, and thank you for the questions which have come in, and sorry if we haven't got through all of them over the course of the webinar, but thank you so much for, do, for taking part. Uh, before we go, I want to go around the houses just one final time uh, to get a final 
sort of key takeaway from all of our panelists. And what I'm wondering is, what's the one big change that you'd like to see happen today or in the near future uh, to ensure that digital technologies support teachers in schools to provide better learning environments? What's the, the main thing you'd like people watching to consider changing? Um, maybe start with uh, Hella Halik from Estonia. Thank you. Uh, I guess what we need as we discontinued using digital mirror in Estonia, we need this monitoring um, tool would what would uh, be long lasting and uh, we could have some longitude uh, studies with that so we could more precisely see how our teacher trainings which implement uh, which also have some influence uh, on our uh, learners digital competencies how we are working out and are we are going in the right direction this is what i think in estonia we need a new uh, monitoring tool, what would last. <laughs> Thank you, Hella, very good indeed. Um, let's turn to Dragana Cooper, as I see you there, project manager at the Croatian Academic and Research Network, Carnet. Uh, what do you think, what's the one big change that you'd like to see regarding digital technologies to ensure they support better learning environments? Well, Duncan, we have seen a lot of changes in the in the past decades and in the last six months, uh, so many changes with disruptive AI technologies. What I would like to see more support for teachers in sustaining really a good balance between sound pedagogical learning and teaching and using technology adequately to support those pedagogical and learning goals. We have seen a lot of investments in equipment, equipping the schools, and we also, as a policymakers, we should be aware that this is putting a lot of burden to schools, to uh, teachers, and especially headmasters' shoulders, and that we have to provide both technical support, pedagogical support, and in instruction, in instruction support uh, for teachers and for students in those schools. We cannot. Uh, expect that with the investment cycle, buying equipment and uh, infrastructure in schools, that our job is done. It's not done, it, it is just beginning because the job of teachers is just beginning there. So we have to think about the uh, uh, crossing the digital divide between uh, those who are less and more uh, digitally competent and also uh, the digital divide in those schools who are maybe in rural areas who lack support uh, that maybe more advanced schools in more urban areas have. And also think about something that is more and more and more on everyone's agenda. This is the digital well-being of uh, both students, but also teachers. This is something that we haven't thought enough, I would say, uh, pre-pandemic, but now we are thinking a lot about uh, the digital addiction, the uh, mental and also physical health, and how we should uh, combine all the, the important things that technology is bringing us in education, but also have the sound approach to, to mental and also physical health of our students. And also, uh, uh, I'm just opening the floor for cybersecurity issues, and this is a huge area. I don't want to go in there, but this is something I'm sure we are all aware that we need to really work a lot together with our teachers there. Thank you so much, Dragana. And look, Andreas, I'll uh, hand over to you here. What's the big change you'd like to see happen today regarding uh, digital technologies? But uh, maybe you want to mention cybersecurity, as Dragana <laughs> mentioned it. I actually think it's a need for greater openness of education systems. There are systems that are more open to innovation, to new ideas that look upward rather than look upward. And, and uh, uh, also, you know, this is not about tech companies taking over schools of education, but it is about creating a new culture of, you know, partnerships between, you know, the innovative ideas that often come from the private sector and, uh, you know, creative development in the schools, in service of the public good. And uh, schools, you know, are often very good to keep students inside and the rest of the world outside. We need schools that are more open to new developments, that are better at anticipating, you know, the evolution of skill demand and actually find creative responses to that. 
Thank you so much, Andreas. And Axel Jean, I'm not sure if you're still with us. He is. OK, the final word goes to you. Over to you, sir. Um, well, thank you very much. The, the point, I think, is uh, to keep the technology for only a, pur a purpose of assistance service to teaching and training uh, professional to help learning with better differentiation, it has been said before, and follow up, and to propose recommendation and decision. The point is to use digital technology and to keep in mind that it's only one facet of teaching process, which is, must be complemented by other practices. So if, if I need to resume that, it's keep the human at the center and keep always the teacher in the loop for students, even when you develop new digital services with edtechs or with other teachers. I think if we think so, we should success. It will take time, but we need to success. Thank you, Axel, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. That is all we've got time for. If you want to learn more about all the things we've been discussing today, then please do go to the OECD website. You'll be able to find the report, uh, Shaping Digital Education, Enabling Factors for Quality, Equity, and Efficiency. Thank you to all our guests. Thank you to the production team led by Cassandra Morley, who is sadly leaving the OECD next week. And thanks to all of you who have watched and joined the webinar. Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Please do join us again for another webinar soon. All the best. <laughs>